Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 437-537 with me, Dr. Uh, Matt Barton. And today I have a wonderful topic for you. Being uncomfortable <laughs> uh, in digital spaces. And I think this artwork here is, of course, H.R. Gigar, one of my favorite artists. His work inspired a lot of the uh, sets and creatures on Alien, as well as uh, various games and cyber cyberpunk games and, and settings but you know, i think i think a, a work like this really gets across the idea nicely of you know we're sort of embedded with technology but it's not always the most comforting uh thought uh, but we'll also talk about credibility uh in digital spaces again this concept of ethos uh, so how basically how can you avoid uh looking bad not, not just embarrassing yourself online but uh, going beyond that, to how can you inspire trust? Uh, how can you get somebody to stick around and listen to what you have to say? And you know, who knows, maybe even change some minds. So uh, a lot of good stuff here. Very rhetorical topics today. Uh, there's uh, Here's our learning objectives. Looks like we have five of them. Uh, we'll be talking about some renegade strategies, branding strategies for blurring the lines between the personal and the professional uh, again, this is where this idea of being uncomfortable comes across a lot of the people, not just yourself, but again, people you might be consulting with, and giving them advice, developing a social media strategy. Uh, they'll probably say, I'm not really comfortable sharing anything. You know, I just want to talk about uh, the bargains <laughs> I have at my store. <laughs> you know, I'm comfortable talking about the uh, the microbrew, uh, beer, or whatever I'm making, but I don't, I don't want to share anything about my... Uh, my family life, for example. So, you know, where do you draw those lines, achieving some kind of authenticity, uh, and not just uh, uh, marketing speak? Uh, we'll also talk about uh, credibility, specifically in digital media. We'll be talking there a little bit about blogs and Twitter, uh, examining the roles of professional communicators in digital spaces. So it's not all that different, as we'll see from traditional print, at least in terms of writing skills and touching an audience. Uh, let's see, fundamental definitional differences between the digital and traditional media, and then a little bit about understanding the code of uh, web pages and sites. So we won't spend a lot of time learning HTML or CSS in this class. Uh, I think it's good stuff to know. I certainly su will suggest that you get on um, uh, YouTube, find some videos, find some tutorials. There's lynda.com is a great place for that. Uh, of course, we have classes on it here at St. Cloud State, uh, but it's just not something I want to delve deeply into for the purposes of this class. But I do at least want to touch on the rudiments so you have some some idea of the uh, possibilities there. Uh, okay, anyway, let's get started. I have a nice picture here of Dwayne Johnson, a.k.a. The Rock. Uh, can you smell what The Rock is cooking? <laughs> I just find this hilarious. The, you know, and by the way, if you've never watched wrestling on uh, TV. It's Monday Night Raw uh, comes on. I think it's the USA channel and then there's another one called Smackdown on Fridays. I think that's on Fox but uh, I think it's hilarious personally. When I, one of my, my rhetoric professor the professor who really introduced me to rhetoric was a huge uh, WWE fan. He was always talking about it and I'll never forget he described it as the most rhetorical of sports. <laughs> if you really want to understand rhetoric math watch WWE, you know, watch these, uh, you know, because it's people might think it's just wrestling, but there's a lot of speeches, a lot of storylines, and uh, and so on. But you know, I always thought he's probably right about that. Uh, but anyway, here's this uh, Rock. You've probably heard of him. I don't know if he got. Uh, did he get his start in to, as a wrestler? I'm not sure what came first, the wrestling or maybe some. He, he seems like he's got multiple talents. Uh, but anyway, this this kind of shocked me. Uh, so he's telling uh, Amy Jo Martin that, that I'm a very private man <laughs> and I'm really not comfortable blending my personal life with my professional life. And this is, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of wary of going off on tangents here, but I just, I find it so fascinating. Uh, one of the things I find so fascinating always have about wrestling in WWE is this idea of the, what they call the kayfabe. Uh, the there's a sort of tacit understanding, kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know that uh, you're part of the business, you're part of the life, 
Uh, so that's the only time you ever <clears throat> are yourself. If there's an outsider that comes by, if you're on TV, if you're doing an interview, whatever, you're always supposed to be in character, uh, kind of uh, perpetuating this idea that the stuff that happens on WWE is real. Uh, when, of course, what's really real is they're probably all buddies or they're you know, going out for drinks together. <laughs> and I often think the same as, uh, I've heard it repeatedly said that the same is true for these politicians. You see, one, one minute it seems like they hate each other, uh, then there's... And then more candid moments are probably on a golf course, just, <laughs> just like everybody else. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, what seems to be happening here is, you know, when you're talking about, well, just go ahead and put your personal life online. Uh, go ahead and just spill it online. You know, people want to see into your personal life. You know, I sometimes wonder if what we're really talking about is this idea of the kayfabe again, like... Uh, let's find something in between uh, totally fake and totally, uh, you know, just sticking up a webcam somewhere that follows you. Uh, there was somebody, I don't know if he was at Stanford, uh, one of these kind of wacky professors just had basically a webcam <laughs> strapped to his head, <laughs> you know, all day long going around. And that was kind of this unfiltered experience of what his life was really like. Of course, you get into the idea of, well, that, is that what your life is like? You're going around with a webcam strapped to your head? Uh, so, so I don't know. Uh, but it is something that Martin keeps coming back to again and again, this idea of you want to be the real you, but you kind of want it to be the best possible you, and you don't want to uh, put too much stuff. I guess uh, you want to reveal aspects of your personality that your fans will find appealing, <laughs> uh, not necessarily the, uh, the TMI stuff of course the attitudes that will just get you in trouble and this is a she uses this acronym i guess it's not an acronym i don't know if you're supposed to say this somehow with them <laughs> with them uh but what's in it for me the what's in it for me question um so she's going to these i guess this is uh what was this this is ufc she's i guess she was uh who was the guy from last time dana uh, white, I think. Could be getting the name wrong. Uh, but she's saying that she would go to these UFC championships and there would be celebrities in the audience, like here's uh, Gordon Ramsay. And so she would run over there and say, hey, uh, Chef uh, Ramsay, can I take your picture and put it on Twitter and all this stuff? And of course, she would, uh, they, I guess they would have the right to say, no, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want you to take my picture. I don't want to be on the side or whatever. Uh, she says usually, though, she was able to talk them into it pretty easily uh, because there is, once they sort of understood, uh, there's kind of a mutual benefit here. Uh, you benefit us because we get to promote, you, we're promoting UFC by showing a picture like this. And, you know, look, Chef Ramsey's here. <laughs> uh, shouldn't you be here, too, even uh, Chef Ramsey? It actually doesn't surprise me at all that he would be at a UFC <laughs> uh, event, but... Uh, Anyway, so that's kind of over. He might have just said, no, I, I'm just here just to have fun. I don't want you know, to be part of anything. Uh, but once he saw that there was that mutual benefit there, the what's in it for me, uh, he was able to respond. You know, this is something that comes up, too, increasingly in uh, research, especially if, you have a re if you're researching people and you're getting uh, clearances and things. A lot of times uh, the we're sort of moving away from this idea of, uh, just being safe to like you, we want it to have some advantages for the the populations that you're studying right uh, you shouldn't just be there sort of basically being a parasite <laughs> uh, just kind of observing them uh, obviously we want their consent but the idea is going beyond just getting consent to some kind of gain for them like some some kind of benefit for them uh, so you even see this in really academic areas not just in marketing and, and business and publicity so it's something that's kind of always in the back of my mind. You know, even with, uh, you know, as a college professor, sometimes we're putting one of my jobs, one of my many, many hats is working with curriculums and uh, professors come in, departments come in with new classes they want, new programs. <clears throat> and a lot of the times we're kind of putting ourselves on this committee in the shoes of students and like, what's in it for the students? Because uh, sometimes what you see is that there's, there's been a lot of thought about what's in it for the department or what's in it for this professor and the professor's research agendas or whatever, their teaching interests. Uh, but we want to kind of come back to what's in it for the students because that's really what 
matters, right? <laughs> if they feel like there's nothing in it for them, they won't take the class. Uh, okay, so here's a question for you uh, along these the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, it's not traditional protocol to bring your personal life to work, uh, but are we all? I, I love this. But are we all expected to stuff our personalities into a business suit every time we cross the office door threshold? Uh, the business, the businesses I enjoy working with the most are usually the lively, eccentric ones. You know, so this is, this is something here that comes up all the time in my 332 class, Writing in the Professions. Uh, we do a couple chapters on job interviews and writing a resume and uh, application letters and all this stuff. And the students always are asking questions like, well, what about, you know, what should I wear? Um, you know, what about tattoos? What about body art, you know, and, and body jewelry and all this stuff? And, uh, most of the textbooks say basically be as conservative as possible, you know, <laughs> be the business suit. <laughs> uh, but I'll always kind of counter that narrative with, you know, I agree with Martin. You know, a lot of the best companies, the biggest, richest company, I mean, look at Apple, uh, Steve Jobs here. And I think, I don't think Waz gets enough attention. I really, he, he's kind of the humble guy you never really hear about uh, on the Apple II story. You should, you should look into him, Waz. Uh, but these, you know, these are not your business suit types. I mean, uh, Jobs is <laughs> he's going off to India meditating and kind of a guru, <laughs> uh, far from this uh, business. And watch, you know, watch his uh, speeches that he used to do uh, when he's promoting the Apple products. I mean, he's really not the stiff uh, suit type. Uh, and even on even on the WWE to bring that back, sometimes they they wear suits and ties, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so I guess it sort of goes both ways, but you know I think you're probably she's probably right. In an, uh, I mean games, the game industry. I mean look at my Matt chats. About half the people there, <laughs> you know that the, they do not look like uh, stodgy, uh, formal, stiff, you know sort of business types. I mean they're really uh, kind of wild and crazy uh, to be honest with you. But you got to try to walk a line, I suppose. Uh, so anyway, what's the question? <laughs> and so what about you? Uh, you know, why do you, where do you think, uh, let me just put it the way that, let's just, I want to ask you the question that she's asking, uh, sort of rhetorically, but I think it's worth exploring. So what do you think? Now, are we all expected to stuff our personalities into a business suit every time we cross the office door threshold? Uh, so what do you think about that? And whether you agree or disagree, what are the implications for social media? All right, so moving on then, she talks some more about The Rock. I don't know why she doesn't want I guess it is kind of awkward to be calling somebody, hey, The Rock. <laughs> she likes some cereal, The Rock. <laughs> That'd probably be good old. So she just calls him DJ. Uh, so she really kind of uh, highlights the strategies, the social media strategies that they worked out. And I think this is really useful. I almost wish she had spent some more time just sort of going into the finer <clears throat> details of this. Uh, but she breaks down the psycho, the psychographics, psychographics, however you say that. Uh, so it's a little bit more than demographics here. We're kind of getting into like psychological metrics uh, with these. And she gives some examples, and I'll show you those in a second. So you can see what that what that term means, uh, but looking at different groups and then having a finer categories, and so it wasn't just DJ's audience and just everybody's in one box. Right? She wants to have all these different categories of people and then different categories of values. I think she calls them uh, bins or buckets, <laughs> uh, which I think is actually a pretty smart strategy. And we've done the same thing again, coming back to curriculum, something much less interesting than DJ. Uh, but with curriculum, we'll come back to this and think about what, what do students value? What do they want out of that edu education? Do they want like applied skills? Do they want more theory? I see my here professors talking about a theory bucket. You know, let's see, this class uh, fills in some of the theory bucket, and this class over here is more of the applied bucket uh, or the civic engagement bucket or whatever it is. The professionalizing bucket is one, uh, but it's pretty much what you know, Martin's talking about here. It seems very similar to that concept. Uh, so what was DJ's audience? What was there? Uh, what's in it for me? And then she says that they determined that 
by listening. This is an interesting idea. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> what do they say? <laughs> uh, of course, we we talked about this before. A lot of times you can ask people, well, what do you want? And they will give you the wrong answer. They'll give you the answer they think you want to hear or an answer they think makes them look good or maybe something they aspire to be uh, when the reality is much different. I mean, of course, the classic example of that for me was the uh, the Netflix. You know, Netflix was, uh, there was a spate of like all these documentaries for a while. And it was, they were asking people like, what kind of content do you want to see more on Netflix? And the response was overwhelmingly like educational, uh, hard hitting, you know, whatever, informative documentaries. Because uh, we kind of like to flatter ourselves into thinking, yeah, that's the kind of stuff I would like to watch. <laughs> Of course, uh, most people were just watching reality TV, you know, and, and stuff like that. So they, uh, it wasn't. <clears throat> you get more out of it sometimes by looking at the behavior of people rather than doing a survey. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Uh, the, here's the brand audit she was talking about for DJ. So why do people follow The Rock on Twitter? Why would you ever do that? Or what kind of people would do that? So this is what they came up with and this seems pretty good there's a whole lot of them <laughs> but inspiration you know I could see this you're you want to work out or you want to get in shape or just be more assertive or something you might go to him uh, for that uh, kids and their families I suppose you know especially those that watch uh, his movies I think she said some of the younger audience uh, watches the movies and that's how they know about him maybe they didn't even know anything about the wrestling uh, the female demographic, or demo, uh, charitable-minded. Uh, so I think he's known for giving to charities and supporting charitable causes. Uh, action fans, that would seem... Action fans of WWE, I probably could have come up with those. <laughs> That's pretty obvious. Uh, but some of these other ones are probably more insightful. Uh, sports and fitness, you know, we could look at that. I don't know if he's got recommendations for supplements or exercise routines. Probably. Uh, but this is, you might think about your own blog that you want to set up and, and start thinking about some potential um, audiences or people interested in your brand and uh, from what angle are they coming or where are they coming from. And this is where uh, they were breaking down these values. And again, to come back to that Netflix you know, example earlier, they were just asking people, like, what do you value the most? And, of course, they were saying, well, education, information. They probably put entertainment, like, down at the bottom somewhere. <laughs> when we all know that should have been way towards the top. Uh, people, what is it, Netflix and chill, uh, not Netflix and take notes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, we can see what they've done here for Dwayne. So people, maybe they want some education from The Rock. Okay. <laughs> Sure. Uh, entertainment value, probably inspiration. You could, I could see that. Uh, something exclusive. You know, that's probably more important than uh, you might think at first, but people might feel like, well, if I follow The Rock on Twitter, you know, I might be getting information there that I couldn't get elsewhere just from watching, uh, watching him on TV or, uh, <clears throat> you know, wherever else he makes appearances. Uh, talk shows and whatnot. Uh, information reciprocation is another interesting one. Really, to me, the exclusive and the reciprocation are some of the most interesting values here. Uh, by reciprocation, we talked about this a little bit last time, but there's this idea that if I, if I tweet something to The Rock, there's a chance he himself might actually respond to that, and that would be a big thrill. Uh, but there's also that vicarious reciprocation. So if, if I'm a fan, I'm I'm talking to The Rock and trying to get his attention. Uh, but I see somebody else achieve that. Then that's kind of like this little, well, you know, if, if they did it, maybe I can do it. But it's also kind of just exciting to see somebody else getting that, uh, that sort of uh, reciprocation. And so I think that one's fun as well. And they often talk on these, if you're talking about YouTube or Twitter or whatever it is, blogs, you know, they really find that if you, if the author comes back and, and answers questions or replies to things uh, or you know people are t tweeting around you replying to your tweets and you reply back uh, it does sort of spur uh, engagement you know you don't want to be too aloof and never respond to any of the uh, 
uh, the comments. Now, so here's a question, another question for you. So Martin writes that she created content templates for each of these audience groups. So just to back up there, kids, families, female, demographic, charitable, etc. Uh, so she's got these different content, uh, content templates for each of the audience groups and determine which of those value buckets here uh, resonated with them the most. And this is on page 77 if you need to refer back to that. Uh, so what I want you to do, uh, let's, I got a link here to The Rock, his uh, Twitter page, Twitter feed. <clears throat> so take a look at this Twitter feed and see if you can sort of come step, work back, reverse engineer uh, to see if you can figure out what are these templates and what which templates go with each, which audience group, and then uh, where do these value buckets fit in? Uh, so see if you can sort of recreate the templates uh, that The Rock is using uh, for these various tweets. And you'll see there's a lot of pretty good variety of uh, tweets on there. Uh, okay, so there's the page numbers. And see if you can describe the structure of the tweets. So hopefully that's clear enough. <laughs> if not, I just flip back to page uh, 77 and it should be uh, clearer. Okay, good luck with that. Let's move on. Uh, here's another question. Before we get to the question, though, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit. Uh, so she says, even if you get it wrong now and then, and you will, and for those of you taking uh, English 300, we read the Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by uh, Jonathan Edward Edwards, and the theme of that sermon is their foot shall slide in due time <laughs> uh, from Deuteronomy. Uh, I just kind of threw that in there for fun. But anyway, uh, the beauty of social media is that followers are quite forgiving if you've built that relationship up first and you've earned it. So if I think you see this a lot. Now, if you think about the celebrities or politicians or hosts of things who, you know, their foot slid into mouth, you know, <laughs> their foot shall slide into their mouth <laughs> in due time, you know, sooner or later, if you're tweeting or Facebooking, you know, you're going to say the wrong thing. You're just going to have one of those days, you know, the uh, not enough sleep, too many, too much coffee, too much alcohol, whatever. Uh, so the, the, the point is you can't you know, sooner or later is going to happen, I guess is the point. But if you have a good relationship with the audience, if they feel like they know you well, uh, then they'll be able to recognize, well, that was, this was an anomaly. This was a, a slip. You know, this was, a, you know, the person, this was a bad day uh, for this person. But, you know, it's okay because we realize that it's not a case of, uh, well, that this is who this person really is. <laughs> and they've sort of been a mystery all this time, and now it's revealed. And so I'm thinking, I don't want to get into any kind of political discussions here, but I'm sure you could think of uh, some uh, some hosts that have, uh, I'm thinking about Bill Maher. You know, he I think he's his foot has slid on several occasions, but he's always managed to, to kind of sort of come back uh, from that. And I think it is because people that watch the show, his audience, uh, they feel like they, I guess he's done enough good stuff or he's, a, they're in enough agreement with him on other things that they're, uh, the relationship is able to withstand these uh, assaults. Uh, whereas other hosts, you know, they're canceled. Okay? They don't ever come back. <laughs> Probably because, because of this, there's not that relationship there. Uh, so it's really something to think about. You know, it'd be interesting to, if, somebody want, if somebody's thinking about a topic for a thesis or something, uh, or papers in other classes. It'd be interesting to compare like a, a celebrity or politician or talk show host, whatever, uh, that didn't come back or that nobody was able to forgive uh, versus the ones that, that were forgiven and then put it in the context of this, of uh, Martin's discussion here. That'd be really interesting. Uh, but anyway, here's a list of 13 epic Twitter fails by big brands. <laughs> I just love these. <laughs> Uh, their foot slid in a due time. So there's 13 there. So you could pick, I think it's just kind of fun just to read a couple of these. I guess I should, probably shouldn't be thinking about it as fun. Uh, you just would think people like would know better. <laughs> you got this kind of corporate power behind you. It's kind of comforting to me, though, to think even these giant corporations can make really silly, foolish mistakes. 
Uh, but look at those and then consider how the, the relationship they had with their uh, their followers or customers or whatever help them or harm them in their ability to recover from that or spring back. Okay, let's see. Now we're moving on to uh, Carol here. Credibility. How much is really different? So I am in 100% agreement with Carol on this. Good writing is valued in digital forms just, it has, just as it has been in other older media. Uh, so we see this, you hear this all the time. Well, people are just, they don't really read online. You know, they, they spend like five seconds on a web page. Uh, it doesn't matter if your stuff is punctuated. You don't even have to capitalize letters. <laughs> just write, you know, absolute... Uh, stream of consciousness stuff and you know it'll be fine and it's just not true uh even in text and i think people confuse sometimes and there's been a lot of studies if you if you do decide to study linguistics or uh, if you get into like the history of writing and things of that sort uh, you'll find a lot of these rules that a lot of errors basically can be divided into different categories uh, some are just kind of fussy uh, what they call blackboard grammar type rules you know, like this, don't split infinitives and things of that sort. Don't end a sentence with a preposition. Uh, they don't really affect meaning in any significant way. Uh, but there's also errors that really do impact meaning. You know, if you're just putting commas in random spots, uh, if, you, if, you, if you're just using that and which, and, and you're getting pronouns confused all the time, using, uh, there's certain kinds of errors basically that do, they're just confusing, they look, make you look sloppy. It doesn't look intentional. Uh, it just looks like uh, reckless editing or no editing. Uh, so I think what we could say there is even if you see tweets sometimes, in a lot of these uh, Twitter users, yes, they're not using academic or standard edited uh, English. They might not even be using capital letters, but they're not doing it inconsistently. You know, they're, they're, they've got a system and you can follow it and you kind of learn to, to speak that, that way or write that read and write that way. Uh, so it's not that it's just random, careless, no effort to be articulate. It's just a different form that they have honed uh, over time. I would still call that good writing. It, it, to me, it's only bad writing if I like it's just confusing or they think they're saying something, but they're really saying something else. Uh, or you're just like, what? <laughs> or it does look like, well, this person just was in a hurry and didn't bother to, uh, uh, to put any punctuation in there. Uh, but Carol does go on to say... That Sturgeon's Law, as a science fiction author, this gets uh, quoted a lot, 90%, 90% of everything is still crap. <laughs> uh, I think Sturgeon just said 90% of everything is crap. Uh, so Carol just says it's still that way. Uh, whether it's writing, whether it's a published in a book, a Facebook wall, or tweeted, uh, what has been produced for all media across time large, largely has been mediocre or worse. And I, my favorite example of this, that come, I, I love to use this. Uh, you'll, you'll hear people say things like, man, the music back in the 80s or back in the 70s or the 60s or whatever, it was so much better. You know, it's just all, these, all this music that's considered classic. And look at the junk. You know, I turn on the modern station and it's just garbage and this... You know, half of this stuff is like hot for one week and then you never hear it again. <laughs> you know, what was so such better musicians, better bands back in the <coughs> back in the 80s. <coughs> but of course, you know, if you listen to a classic rock station, you're, you're getting like 10 <laughs> percent. You're getting that 10 percent <laughs> of all the music produced in that decade that wasn't crap. You know, you're getting like the cream of the crap. <laughs> well, I don't think that's the cream of the crap. <laughs> Maybe it's cream of the crap. I don't know. Uh, but you're just getting like the sliver, the stuff that's withstood the test of time. You know, it's sort of the, the garbage is sort of filtered out by this point. And so that's the only reason you've, if you listen to like a classic rock station, you're like, oh, there's another hit. Oh, <laughs> there's another hit. <laughs> well, of course, because they're, you know, all the other stuff has been filtered out. Uh, so I think that certainly this is true. If, you, if you're on YouTube and you're looking at like the top stuff, yeah, that might be, 
popular for a day or even sometimes even just for hours, you know, and then it's gone. Uh, but the really good stuff, the really solid stuff that you come back to and you rewatch, you know, every once in a while, you know, that, that's really the good stuff uh, that will stick around. But, you know, one of the arguments that Lawrence Lessing, Lessig, Lessing or Lessing? Uh, anyway, the free culture author, uh, a lawyer, really popular in uh, media studies and, and intellectual property discussions. Uh, he likes to say things like, well, we kind of need, you need this, This uh, the more crap you have, I guess, the more gems <laughs> you have as well. <laughs> so you just have all these amateurs producing stuff everywhere. You know, there's at least going to be a couple of those that will be the real star performers and the breakout uh, performances. And of course, the problem gets to be, well, how do you know, how do you ever get to those? Will they just be lost? Uh how will there's that signal get above the noise, uh, which we're kind of talking about there with the organizer of information. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I still love talking about this stuff. I kind of get uh, pulled away in so many rabbit holes. All right, unchanged writer's roles. So here he's just elucidating some of this uh, point about the old the old skills are still worth are still uh, worthwhile. So if you're a good writer, you're still communicating. Well, I guess you could say social media writers, Twitter users, whatever, Twitterers, tweeters. <laughs> they're still communicating a message. And that message could just be worthless clickbait. You know, just we used to call it just a pulp novel, pulp fiction, just something. Uh, it's, it's entertaining. It's amusing, but there's no depth to it at all. So that's true. If it's uh, some stupid uh, top 10 list or whatever, that's clickbait uh, but you know the point is there's always been stuff like that <laughs> I pick up a newspaper there's just a lot of garbage uh, in there that people just like to read you know, a lot of people love reading horoscopes you know and everybody knows this is just kind of a silly thing uh, it's not based on any kind of uh, science <laughs> but who cares it's not the point it's just amusing people like it uh, but they wouldn't probably wouldn't consider it worthwhile if you really uh, ask them that seriously uh, let's see, something truly provocative, clever, amusing, interesting, or profound. Yes, yeah, so we do like the, even on Twitter, there are certain people that are known uh, for being profound or just being interesting. Uh, George uh, Takei, I always forget how to pronounce his name, uh, but he played a Sulu on uh, Star Trek. Really popular Twitter. Uh, he's got a really popular Twitter feed just because... He, Whatever he posts, he's, he, it's always going to be something. You might not agree with him, uh, but it would be something interesting and thought-provoking. You know, people come back uh, to him for that. He's probably one of the top uh, Twitter users. Uh, two, organizing information, right, filtering out the noise. Uh, so you see there's all, all these sites. Was it Imgur? Yeah, a lot of you probably know more about these than I do, but like with the memes, there's just thousands upon thousands of thousands of memes that come out every day, uh, probably hundreds by the hour, and you don't ever see, you probably don't even see 10% of those, but the ones that you do see are the ones that have been filtered. You know, these uh, various sites, they'll let you vote on the memes, and they kind of rise up the charts, and eventually they get to somebody's Facebook page that you're following, and you see it there, and then you share it, and in a way you're kind of filtering out the noise of all those uh, crappy ones <laughs> that weren't funny. <laughs> Uh, and then lastly, interpreter, leveraging the medium's strengths and mitigating its weaknesses. Uh, some <clears throat> messages are better blogged than tweeted. I think we could all agree with that. Uh, that short form, the 140 characters or whatever, doesn't always work well. You know, usually what you want, especially if it's some kind of sustained discussion, you want to take to, uh, <clears throat> to WordPress or something to blog it. You might want to do a YouTube channel or a podcast channel is a good place for certain kinds of discussion. You know, you think you might think, well, a podcast and a YouTuber, podcaster and a YouTuber sound very similar, and there's a lot of overlap there. But you could think, what kind of content would work better on the as a YouTube video than a podcast? And I usually come back to if you think about what I do with the video games, I think it's really better in video because you, know, you can actually show the games you're talking about. You could show them being played. 
Uh, whereas on a podcast, you just have to describe it in words. Uh, but there are things that people do like just to listen to, and they don't necessarily need to see. You know, college lectures being one. <laughs> you know, that's one thing I like about The Great Courses Plus. Uh, I hardly ever just watch the lecture on TV. And you, what I'll do instead, I'll just put my headphones on, uh, you know, go to bed. It's like my nighttime listening. Uh, so I've kind of got my eyes closed. Now, if I was sitting in a class, you know, like this, the professor would probably get <laughs> upset. <laughs> you know, but the truth is it works well to just kind of, you know, tune everything else out, really focus in on the words. Uh, so it's a great medium. Podcasting is a great medium for any kind of like lecture style uh, or conversation style uh, formats. Now, see, terms of space. Uh, so here he's talking about how when you go to a website, you don't always start off at the home page. You don't. You probably don't go to like NewYorkTimes.com, StCloudTimes.com, and you know, start there. What probably happens you you see a link on a Facebook page uh, or a tweet, right? And it's like something St. Cloud. You click on it and it goes right to the article. Uh, so you're not really. You might not even know like what site is this. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of the the fake stuff you see on on Facebook. You're like, what? Okay, that sounds. That sounds kind of crazy, that news item. And then you click on it, and it's going to this weird page. You, you've never heard of this you know, website before. And so you kind of have to go back and try to find the home page, just to check to make sure this is legit stuff. Usually what I'll do, too, is Google. If I'm really uncertain, I'll, I'll Google it as well and see, well, is, it, is this uh, news, you know, this, they're saying somebody died, let's say, uh, or there's some scandal or whatever. Oh, I'm trying to think of one recently. There was one recently that I just thought was really questionable. <laughs> I forget what. Uh, but I remember getting on Google and like I didn't see any other. Uh, oh, I think it was uh, yeah Terry Jones uh, from Monty Python passed away. But I was only able to find it on like this one little Facebook post. And it was when I clicked on it, it, was, it didn't go to the BBC or anything like that. It was just this sort of personal looking uh, blog, I think, or website. And then I, I tried to get find it on the BBC. I wasn't seeing anything there. And I'm like, surely you know, this something would be said about this on the BBC's website. Uh, nothing was on any of the other news sources. Uh, so I was convinced that was just some, somebody had just maliciously posted that. And of course, later it did start to come off, uh, come out on these trusted news sources. Uh, but, but even, and that's a good example, even me, I wasn't able to figure out. I didn't know that was accurate information. It was on this uh, a website. I didn't know. I didn't have any context for whether I could trust that site or not. So, you know, I didn't. <laughs> In that case, it turned out to be real, but it could just have easily have been. You know, it just it makes me feel sick inside to think that there's people that would find that sort of thing funny, uh, to pretend like somebody had had died, uh, or, or having a medical emergency. But, you know, there, <laughs> there's all kinds of uh, people out there. Uh, he also says you need to switch from uh, think paper mode to think web mode because web users are monsters of impatience. Yes, we are monsters of impatience. You know, believe it or not, some of those monsters are even <laughs> in my classes. <laughs> like, Barton, your lectures are too long. Ah, you monster of impatience. Ah. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's, this is an easy sort of generalization to make. Yeah, of course. You know, we got all this other stuff, all these apps, you know. Uh, I hear professors say, how can I personally compete with everything on the Internet? You know, there's just no way that's going to happen. You know, so you tell your students, please put the devices down. <laughs> you know, I I, I'm sorry, I can't compete with Fortnite or, or whatever. Uh, this is the mouse button and the sheer abundance of apps. Put your content one click or scroll away from oblivion. Uh, so again, this is stuff that people hammer on all the time. Uh, I tend to think it's a little bit exaggerated. Uh, if it's, I think what we do pretty quickly is figure out: is this something that's interesting? Is this relevant to me in any kind of way? Is this something I, I want to know more about? And if it is, then a lot of this other stuff, you're like, well, okay, I'll, I'll settle down, I'll settle in, <laughs> and read this. <laughs> uh, versus, eh, I don't have time for that, and, and move on. I don't know what difference, may, might not make any difference how well it was worded or how well it was organized. 
Now, if you don't make that connection right away to being relevant, you'll move on. Uh, let's see, the Philip Myers Credibility Index. Now, so here's some good theory, and I'll try to point, <coughs> I probably haven't been doing this enough in, the, in this course, but, you know, especially as you get towards the senior level work and the graduate level work, there's always talk about theoretical frameworks and theory uh, that with a big T or little t that you can use uh, to explore issues. Uh, so here's a good example Carol brings in Philip Meyer and a credibility index. So I, I think it's always worth noting these things and kind of seeing if we could try to figure out what is this credibility index all is what, what is this all about and if you if you like this where could you go for more info? So I put the page number there, but you could read up more. I'm sure there's probably books uh, by Meyer on this. Uh, this is a good example, though. Something you could take some of this language, take this credibility index, and go and apply it uh, to Twitter or whatever it was you wanted to study, and it would be legitimate research. Uh, but he's got, I guess Meyer has these two keys to the index. Believability, believability and community affiliation. Uh, affiliation should be bolded there. So believability and community affiliation. Believability... That's the notion that the news media present accurate, unbiased, and complete accounts of news and events. <laughs> I think somewhere in here, <coughs> somewhere else in here, he says that uh, basically millennials think that no news media is accurate, unbiased. You know, I, I have to agree. You know, it's not a big revelation though for those of us who study rhetoric or teach critical thinking. This is what we've been saying all along. Is that there's yes don't there's nothing there's no such thing as objectivity, a complete objectivity, complete accuracy. There's there's always going to be some bias in there, even you know it, it, there's unconscious bias. And this is a uh, it's not like you want to be biased uh, necessarily, and you might even think you're not, but you are unconsciously <laughs> biased. <laughs> uh, so this is a really troublesome concept, <clears throat> you know, or I guess you could say it's not really surprising that people. Are, are not uh, believing everything. Uh, but then we get to this idea of the community affiliation. Uh, so this is, I guess, where these, what makes this theory kind of interesting. So the community affiliation encompasses a news organization's efforts to unify and lead the community it serves, efforts that require some degree of harmony in outlook or perspective. <clears throat> so I think this is the bit here that really nails it for me. Uh, you hear about uh, things, I think this author, Carol, talks a lot about newspapers are dying. And they, it's always in the context, well, newspapers are dying because people are getting news from online and they're watching television news. But uh, I, I don't think it's right. I think Meyer is correct. I don't know if it necessarily, it's, that's probably involved, but I think it's more to do with this community affiliations is, is people that are seeing well, the, this newspaper, the, the political views of this newspaper uh, doesn't, they're not my views, right? They're not serving me. This is like a, you know, the voice from uh, New York or whatever. Uh, or they're saying this is uh, not, there's not enough local, regional news in this newspaper. You know, this is, they're looking at the same stuff that I can watch on TV. <clears throat> it doesn't really serve me, you know, my community. Uh, so if you look at you know, sometimes I wonder if that's what it has more to do with, and especially when you think about these changing demographics. And, you know, who is actually, you know, if we wanted to scroll back to that uh, image with the brand, with the different buckets and stuff, and you're thinking about who would actually be an audience for a newspaper these days, you know, who would buy a newspaper instead of uh, just getting news from Facebook? And then you want to say, well, what that, that type of person you know, would they, what, what would be some of their values? You know, if you could start matching up the values uh, with this uh, community affiliation, I think then it might not, you know, it might turn out to be less to do with like print versus digital and more to do with just this harmony of a perspective that he's talking about here. But, you know, this is, you know, I could spend a lot of time uh, thinking about these issues. You know, I think it's really interesting too, this idea of like, well, you know, if you did think that, like if you're reading the St. Cloud Times, and you feel like this this serves my community. Uh, the St. Cloud Times is really uh, supportive. Uh, they share my views. We have this harmony of outlook and perspective. Therefore, I can believe 
uh, what they're presenting is accurate, unbiased, and, and complete. So that to me, is that this is really fascinating stuff here. Uh, then he also goes on to talk about Johnson and Kay. Uh, so some more, uh, some more stuff you could compile into a theoretical framework. Uh, but Johnson and Kay found that for blogs, including the writer's perspective in the writing, made it more credible. And they say, you know, like, and this is Klein and Burstein apparently. Now, objectivity has outlived its usefulness as an ethical touchstone of journalism. Again, no big shocker <laughs> for those studying rhetoric and critical uh, thinking. As in other words, far from trying to present yourself, well, I'm neither, you know, I'm not just talking a party line or I'm not going to tell you. Uh, it doesn't matter what my political views are. I'm just presenting the news objectively. Uh, they say people aren't people aren't really buying that. You know, it's not gonna <laughs> you're not gonna have much of an audience. <laughs> You'd actually be better off just making it clear, like where you stand, and then that way people would have. Well, it's a good question. So, you know, if you're like, well, this is my perspective, and then you made that clear, would that just turn away people that didn't agree, or didn't already share those values? Would that be the effect, or would it be more like, well, now that I know where your bias is, I can use that as a to sort of more accurately weigh uh, what you're saying. Uh, at least you wouldn't feel like you're just being manipulated. Uh, to me, that's the worst thing is when somebody's, when you feel, when you really just feel like somebody's just being manipulative, they're being deceitful, they're trying to cover up their motives, right? You know, Martin talked about that as well. Uh, that's probably more damaging than the people that would say, well, okay, uh, I'm not going to listen to you. You've made it clear where your biases are. And since I don't share those, I'm going to tune out. And I guess the argument is you're better off with that. Uh, you'd actually lose less of an audience that way than you would by being uh, duplicitous or trying to play both sides or uh, something like that. Uh, let's see, identification. Oh, yeah, this is where he uh, brings in Kenneth Burke. I uh, love uh, Burke. Great. He writes a lot of books about uh, literary theory, literary studies, uh, Grammar of motives, rhetoric of motives. So he's really relevant to bring into this discussion. I was kind of surprised to see him in Carroll. I was really encouraged uh, to see that. <laughs> it kind of made my day to see Burke in this uh, book on digital editing and uh, writing. And again, this is somebody I could talk about for, for years. You could probably read his books for years. But, but anyway, here's a couple of the quotes about Burke. Uh, humans are individuals. But when their interests are joined, or one perceives or is persuaded to believe that they are joined, uh, then identification occurs. And the everyday person voice, oh, this is a Carol's interpretation. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Burke. You know, we have a whole course. Uh, we have courses dedica dedicated to rhetoric and rhetorical theory where you can learn more about him. Uh, but really, this, the key to Burke, I think, is this concept of identification. So he talks more about groups and being affiliated with a group, uh, identifying with a group, uh, the symbols, the logos, the styles of a group, uh, that tends to have a lot more influence than just a speech or a direct uh, appeal, uh, an advertisement of some sort. You know, the, and I, I'm always thinking, they really should talk about Burke. The people that are running the university should read Kenneth Burke because uh, they're always talking about this need for people to feel the sense of belonging. And they, they say that if you want a student to stick through their uh, program and graduate, a lot of that has less to do with their SAT score or how quote-unquote smart they are or whatever. Uh, what it really comes down to is do they feel like they belong? Do they, do they identify as a St. Cloud State student, as a Husky, you know, whatnot? And so I think that's where, like, the sports comes in. You know, the, the, the logos, the colors, uh, the branding, just the, the social events, the, even like parties and things. Uh, anything that makes you feel like, you know, these are my people here. These are my peeps. <laughs> so, yeah, I feel like I belong. Uh, that's when the identification, that's that's going to be a lot more persuasive on you, right, than if you just, you, know, you, you go to like a really great speech by the president or something. Just not, no matter how great that speech is, it's not going to have, that the, the power that that feeling of belonging would have. And uh, Burke goes on to say in his books, it's not just that, this is like a 
accumulation of things over a long time as many, many small things that build up uh, to make you feel like you either are part of this group and, you know, if you're part of this group, then you have to set yourself apart from this this other group. <laughs> it's always it's kind of us and a them. Uh, so it gets really interesting and uh, sociological. So anyway, I recommend uh, Burke. Uh, let's see, over here, Carol says, the everyday person voice of many blogs encourages identification in ways that the dispassionate clinical filtered voices of traditional media cannot. So, you know, again, he's just spot on with this. You know, a lot of these popular uh, uh, talking heads, uh, the podcasters, the YouTubers, you know, if you're talking about somebody like a, a Joe Rogan type, uh, who's some of, some of the other ones, there's like a million of them, <laughs> uh, but they, they, they don't, they're not slick, you know, they don't sound like NPR, you know, I've heard some of them, they'll actually make fun of uh, NPR, you know, because NPR always has that, that solace, <laughs> the NPR values your membership, you know, it's, it's almost like the soporific uh, type of a uh, voice, you know, they, they try to strip it of any kind of uh, passion. You know, of course, they can't help it sometimes. It's, they, you can still kind of hear the venom sometimes if they don't like the person they're talking about. Uh, but they're saying that it's kind of hard to identify with that sort of robotic, uh, sort of monotone, <laughs> passionless tone. Uh, even if you disagree uh, with the more bombastic types, you kind of appreciate the energy. You kind of want to identify more with that uh, sort of high octane news you know it was like this guy's in the martial arts or whatever with all the tattoos it looks like a pretty cool uh dude you know so i want to identify with him uh not but but you know even with the NPR, now that i'm thinking about it though yeah you, know, you have the the npr it sounds very boring but you notice they have some symbols that go with npr memberships like the uh if you donate money uh, they give you like bumper stickers and like a little handbag. <laughs> uh, you know, this, this, you're sort of identifying the ways, I guess, is like this is in support of public broadcasting. It's probably green uh, somehow. You know, who knows? But there's certainly identification that takes place there. Uh, but the point here really is it's more about these groups and the communities around these uh, individuals uh, or stations or whatever more than just a, an advertisement or a commercial. You know, it's who do you, you know, are you an NPR type? Do, I, do you identify more with that or do you identify more with uh, somebody on YouTube uh, who's doing uh, something a little more um, uh, controversial maybe or kind of has a, a bad reputation? Uh, transparency. Uh, so he's talking here about some of these old, sort of the monolithic giant corporations of the news media. I don't feel like we necessarily need to spend a lot of time on this. It just says that you know, even the New York Times are feeling this need to be more uh, transparent, talking about how they made their decisions and values. And I think recently they were, uh, they endorsed like two different candidates <laughs> for, for president. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on with them anymore, really. Uh, but I'm sure somewhere they explain like how why they did that and how they arrived at that decision. Uh, and then across the pond, so to speak, here at BBC, this is a Sandbrook of BBC World Service. Uh, they're also following a similar trajectory. They say, we don't own the news. Uh, we don't own the news anymore. This is a fundamental realignment of the relationship between these large media companies and the public. So even these uh, giant, well-established, well-entrenched media are, are feeling this this pull uh, to be more transparent. And people just, you know, as we said, people just aren't buying it anymore. They realize that there's some kind of bias. Uh, so they need the tools to be able to, uh, you know, factor in where that, how they should uh, adjust, I suppose, or how, how, they, how they can be better skeptics if they know uh where the uh, article is likely to be skewed, which way. Uh, accountability. Uh, individuals, companies, and organizations must explain themselves, right? They should be accountable. Uh, BuzzFeed got into trouble a couple of times over this. You know, the, the, the stuff they post turns out to be false, and it, by the time they figure out that it's false, it's done a lot of damage. Uh, so then uh, they're, they're held accountable, quite rightly so, for that. 
uh, people don't just let it go. You know, they have to come back and explain in a human sense, <laughs> you know, what, what happened there. Let's see. We shouldn't try to kill the human voice. The challenge is how to adhere to professional standards such as ethical news gathering and balance uh, and the overall presentation of perspectives, but at the same time, the communication must be in real human voices. Right, so when somebody is held accountable, a company, a newspaper, or whatever, uh, you, sometimes you get what I call the faux apology. <laughs> you know, it's a sort of boilerplate legalese, very P PR driven sort of apology. Uh, it sounds totally inauthentic. Uh, whereas other times you, you really feel like they are sorry. You know, you can, you can hear this. It's a very hum human. Uh, it's something about it that moves you uh, when you see that. You know, I don't care how good the boilerplate is or how great somebody's lawyers are or whatever. It's just not going to have the same impact. Uh, let's see, some steps to improve credibility. Uh, so just a few slides left here, but th these are actually some really good uh, slides to be thinking about. So you get on a website and you're like, is this something I can trust? Is it, is it fake news? You know, is it is this legit? So you're asking those kind of questions. You know, somebody just trying to pull my leg. You know, is this the onion? Uh, who knows? So what what kind of factors have people used to determine this? You know, and you could be evil and flip this around and think, well, what if I do want to create some fake some fake uh, websites? I can take the same set of strategies and, and leverage them <laughs> so people will be more convinced. Uh, but anyway, is it easy to use? That's, you know, a good website. You're going to be able to find stuff, navigate through it. It's not going to be confusing or look strange. Uh, User-friendly design, kind of the same thing there. You know, it's uh, <clears throat> you don't have to think too hard about moving around the site. Uh, High-quality graphics, that's probably a big one. You know, if you're just seeing like clip art, something that looks like PowerPoint from the 1980s, or <laughs> was that, I don't know if it was around the 80s, but <laughs> and if you're seeing like that old standard clip art, uh, if there's Clippy on there, uh, if you're looking at uh, Dancing Bananas, <laughs> it's just something that looks amateurish, shoddy looking, low res type stuff. Uh, you might think that's probably uh, not legit. Uh, the writing, you know, this is a, I'd probably put that one maybe even above the navigation. You know, because again, if you're reading something and you can tell this person's not making any effort, there's no editing here, there's just errors all over the place, the spelling is bad, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really confusing, awkward, uh, you're going to really have serious doubts. And you might be thinking, this is probably some kid somewhere writing this, right? Uh, full contact information. This is a one you probably don't think too much about. You really should, though. You know, if somebody, if this is a blog, can you, is there anything there about like who wrote this and, you know, how, there should be like an about and an author page with a byline, uh, some way to respond, email, you know, the, the St. Cloud Times is actually good about this. So if you read an article, they will have the, the email there of the reporter and, and you could email the reporter directly. You know, and I've done this and, you know, chatted with some of these reporters before, you know, it's just, they're not surprised by that. It's routine. Uh, business for them makes it a lot more credible. You know, I, I really like that <laughs> being able to do that. <laughs> uh, expertise in the subject area, you know, that one kind of goes without saying. If you feel like the person knows what they're talking about, you'll take them seriously. Uh, links outside to other relevant sources and sites. You know, this one even gets academics in trouble sometimes. Though this even happened to me sometimes. Uh, I'll find a, a really great page, you know, maybe it's like a CSS guide, JavaScript, whatever, something really just perfectly, you know, it's good information, all this other stuff, uh, but they'll foolishly put advertisements on there or they will have links to stuff uh, or they'll have their comments open where anybody can come in and post these other links. Uh, so next thing you know, you're clicking on something and it's not appropriate, uh, who knows what it is, but even though they they didn't write that. Maybe they didn't even put that link there. Uh, maybe that was put there by some advertiser. Now, nevertheless, it does affect everything else. You're like, oh, you know, I, look at that. They've got an advertisement here uh, for this company that's known for 
uh, doing terrible things. Uh, so I'm not going. I'm not going to trust any of the other information on the page. All right. So here's a quick exercise for you. So I've got Stanford's Web Credibility 10 Guidelines page. Uh, so just click there. Click the link. Look. Check out those guidelines. Uh, and then when you're done with that, I've got three different options for you. You don't have to do all of these. Okay, uh, just pick the one that sounds interesting to you. Uh, we've got SESU's English page, and St. Cloud Times page, and then Gopher Bargain Center. I think you'd probably have more fun with Gopher Bargain Center. A lot of gophers. Uh, but anyway, uh, look at these guidelines, and then go back, maybe have the guidelines. If you, know, if you, if you have a big enough screen, maybe you could like open up the guidelines, have them on one side, then bring up the... Uh, the page on the other one and just kind of go through them you don't necessarily need to talk about every guideline you know but see which one of the guidelines maybe there's one or two uh, where you feel like they really uh, missed the mark that they could really stand to improve upon and then think about how that you know tell me what that guideline is and how they're breaking it but then also how addressing it would improve their uh, credibility Okay, a couple of last uh, slides here. Uh, here they're talking a little bit more about the civic engagement. Or the, I guess we could link this to that Meyer idea earlier of the community affiliation. Uh, the civically engaged are more likely than the less engaged to use and value news, and that's according to Pew Research Center. Those who report having a strong connection to their communities display stronger local news habits. Americans who rate their local communities as excellent have more positive views of their news media than those who rate their communities less highly and vice versa. So again, this sounds very much like the what Myers or Meyer was Philip Meyer was saying. You know, if you like if you if you really feel that sense of belonging, if you value, you, know, you have the strong ties to the community, then you probably like the newspaper more. <laughs> kind of makes me wonder like uh, which comes first. It's almost this uh, chicken and egg situation. Uh -huh. But there certainly seems to be something here. So you wonder, like, if the goal is to promote civic engagement, if you want people involved in the community, maybe part of that would be having a really good newspaper and having people uh, read the news and want to read the news and feel like the news is, you know, not coming to them, not not speaking at them or preaching to them or something, uh, but really representing their community. <laughs> <laughs> their values. I think that's where a lot of uh, newspapers miss the mark. Okay, so I said I wouldn't go into all this HTML, XML, and CSS business. There's people that could do it a lot better than me. Uh, if you are interested in it, you know, again, we have Mark Gill here at the uh, Visualization Studio. I'm sure he'd be happy to work with you. Of course, you could just get on YouTube or lynda.com and find things. Uh, the problem is it changes so fast, a lot of this stuff, by the time you uh, get a book or something, it's already obsolete. So you have to, it's, to me, I always recommend if it's uh, computer related, you're probably better off with YouTube or Linda, some kind of online uh, learning is probably better than just getting books from the library because uh, this, like I say, it changes so fast. Uh, but anyway, here's a couple of, uh, I do want to say a couple things about it. Uh, first, one of the reasons people use things like WordPress or Twitter or Facebook or whatever is because they don't want to learn the scripting or they don't know the scripting or they think it's going to be really hard so they're intimidated by it. Which is kind of sad because I think it's really useful just to know the basics. It's kind of this become this joke about learn to code. You know, people, uh, it's almost like a weird political thing. I, I don't know. Uh, but I agree, it's, it actually is good to learn to code uh, even if you're not a computer programmer or you're interested in that, uh, just knowing enough about it to know like how it works behind the scenes and just knowing like the rudiments uh, is very helpful you know, in ways you might not expect. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples here. Uh, one is HTML. Uh, this is kind of the what most people learn about first, hypertext markup language. So it uses these tags. So it's really not all that complicated. You can see, you might be able to figure out what happens here. You put these little greater than, less than symbols around the letter or words. There's different tags or codes you use. But here's just a real simple one. So you put the B or some people, sometimes you put strong 
the word strong in there instead of the B. You know, it's different depending on different browsers. But okay, again, <laughs> just forget all that. Basically, this would be fine in most most situations. You put the square brackets B. That's going to make that bold. Uh, so when you run this, uh, what you'll see they they won't have the tags in here, so you won't see the B and the slash B. You'll just see the word bold, but it'll be in bold. Uh, that's called the markup language. And if you're in WordPress, or even, uh, I'm pretty sure if you're using D2L, you know, anytime you have like a, uh, a site with a, what they call a real text editor, or what they call that, the uh, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get editor. Uh, so if you look carefully, if you're scrolling all around, you usually see a button called like uh, HTML, or sometimes it'll be the, uh, what do they call that, the uh, raw version or something like that. So you click it. And then you'll be able to see these little codes everywhere. Because uh, what that WYSIWYG editor does is just, it puts these in for you. So you just have like a Microsoft Word style ribbon. So you're like, okay, highlight this, make it bold. But if you go into the hyper or the HTML mode, you'll be able to see where it put those tags in for you. Now what's useful with this is sometimes you're using something like D2L or WordPress and you've got some weird stuff. Like some stuff is bold, uh, you've got some weird spaces, some gaps between paragraphs. You're like, how do I, you're like deleting, uh, it won't, especially you know, like with the lists and bulleted lists sometimes, like it won't stop bulleting. It's like bulleting everything. Ah, it's bulleting everything. So you're like trying everything to fix the, the bullets not working. Uh, so what's, if you know a little bit about HTML and you, you know to look for these tags, you can go into the, you know, click that button that says HTML. And then just look there and you can see like, okay, there's the problem. It's got a, like a, it's starting a list here, but somehow or another, it didn't uh, stop the list. You know, so we, we've got the open list, but it never, you know, does the slash uh, list to stop the list. So if you know enough to know something like to look for this, you can often find that and say, okay, let me just add that uh, to stop the list there. And problem solved, you switch back to the regular editor and, and you're good sounds maybe like a lot of work or something but you know that can be a real <clears throat> once you know how to do this it can save a lot of time and you know it's it's always I don't know it, it just kind of bugs me sometimes <laughs> if you can't like stop the bullets or you've got these gaps uh, so I'm always like take a minute to like fix that uh, if you can uh, so that's HTML uh, CSS uh, this is a huge development uh, they came out. I'm not sure exactly what the year years are that where, where this came out. I sort of remember being on the web and you'd hear about stuff and people. Uh, there's like what was it? Ninety percent of everything is crap. <laughs> so, there's like a whole bunch of stuff that comes out that has something to do with uh, writing on the web. And ninety percent of it is you hear about it for a while and then it is gone. I and mean, I would uh, honestly want to put Flash. Uh, in that category, you know, it was like for a while everything was flash and everything had to be animated and all this custom uh, menus and things. And uh, that all went away pretty quick. But the CSS is like one of those things that stick, that's like the, one of the 10% items that, that stuck around because uh, it is just so incredibly useful and it's simple uh, to use. It's a little bit of, you know, I got a little snippet here uh, of some of the language. It looks a little weird maybe, but. You know, I promise you like 10 minutes and you could figure out how to use this and you're going to be like, wow, how did I ever <laughs> live without this? <laughs> uh, so if, you, if you're if you on WordPress, you can download a little plugin. I think it's called something like CSS Editor. <laughs> so it lets you change some of the codes. But basically what happens is uh, you got a website and if you have done the whole thing in HTML, then you know every time you said like bold, make a heading, do this, do that, make it this size. It's kind of like with Microsoft Word. You notice sometimes you have, you might have some students, or you might have done this yourself. So you're saying, I want all my subheadings to look this way, or I've got, you know, maybe five, six different files, and I want to go in and change all the headings. I want the fonts to be different sizes and whatnot. So you're basically like, okay, sh highlight that, bump it up a notch, change the font, change the color. And you're doing that every time, right? Item after item after item. Open up the next file. Do the same thing. It's very tedious work. It's, 
it, it's it's repetitive work and if you're on a computer you should never be doing repetitive work if, if, if it's something like that you should just tell the computer to do it and just have the computer do it for you in seconds and you say how do I do that well <laughs> welcome to the world of coding <laughs> and that's why people say you need to know how to code uh, but even with this information here well like even with word you know I say don't uh, instead of like highlighting every heading and bumping it up the font and uh, doing all that just when you're making your documents uh, highlight the heading and if you look up at the top there there's a little thing that says styles on it and if you click on that you could say make that heading one uh, this is heading two a little bit smaller heading three just do that throughout the whole document and what that lets you do later is you could just say okay now I decided I want all my headings to be in sans serif fonts I want a sans serif font for those I want a serif fonts for the body text well instead of having to like go through the whole thing highlight 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 change 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 you just say go into the style menu all the headings change them all boom so <laughs> that's a little bit easier and this uh, CSS is the same type of deal so you see here what what we're looking at here is they're saying the heading one so this would be like your biggest heading uh, you say I want that to be pink so h1 curly bracket color colon pink uh, semicolon uh, close that out you're done uh, so every time there's a heading one uh, the, the color will be pink you don't have to go in and like with the HTML here and every time every heading put in color pink uh, just one time uh, and it's done so they call it a cascading style sheets because it can kind of cascade throughout your whole uh, website depending on where you put it in the in your folders in your hierarchy uh, with uh, WordPress you can get a lot more granular than this you know you'll see things like the individual posts the type of post can have a different style sheet you can get into like the uh, the, the menus and sub menus change the colors the backgrounds of things there's, there's a lot of power here just in a little bit of a uh, code so you know I feel like I should get paid by the CSS people at this point <laughs> uh, just trust me uh, watch a couple videos on it you know, go to like HTML tutorial or CSS tutorial on YouTube you know, spend about 10 15 minutes and that's probably enough to get at least a, a semblance you know some idea of uh, the potential of that and, and then if it's something you want to pursue uh, you could certainly do a lot more with it probably from there you'd want to go into well, JavaScript or something and then you can really start to make interactive uh, websites and you know a lot of possibilities start opening up all right, I uh, got about an hour and 12 minutes here. Uh, so thank you very much for watching that. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please do ask a question. If you have a comment, uh, make a comment. Uh, but at any rate, have a great day and see you next time.